Most of the geopolitical events in East Asia revolve around China. The decisions that Beijing makes have a profound impact on the region. As China adopts a new foreign and domestic policy, regional nations must adapt as well. In this analysis, we will go over some of these geopolitical changes and explain what awaits East Asia in 2017. My name is Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. If you'd like to see more content like this, check out our fundraising page on patreon.com slash Caspian Report for ways to help us expand the channel. After decades of rapid economic growth, China's economy is in midst of a transformation. In the next few years, the country will shift from an economic structure based on low-cost exports to an economic model based on service and private consumption. Obviously, this shift will include lower economic growth. As a result, some divergent forces within the ruling Communist Party will seek to use the diminished financial prospects to replace President Jinping. Therefore, the changes occurring in the Chinese economy will have political consequences which will determine the course of history. As president of 1.3 billion people, Jinping's schedule for 2017 includes two major events which will determine the immediate future of the country. In October 2017, China's Communist Party will hold its 19th National Congress, which is basically a re-evaluation of the ruling administration. For Jinping, it will be imperative to consolidate strength during the gathering and reassure the political elite that he is the patron of their power. For this reason, the Chinese leadership will seek to ensure political and economic stability by implementing cautious reforms and avoiding risks of instability. Meanwhile, in the months leading up to the Congress, Jinping will seek to empower friends and allies in key provinces, ministries and military posts. The president will also be presented with a unique opportunity to dominate China's Politburo Standing Committee, in which at least five of the seven members are expected to retire in 2017. Jinping will seek to fill those seats with allies and thus ensure his leadership within the Communist Party. The second major event concerns Hong Kong's chief executive election, which is scheduled for March 2017. For top officials in Beijing, the election is an occasion to consolidate power in the city. However, if Jinping decides to mingle in the elections or if he attempts to exercise more authority in the region, it could backfire and embolden the Hong Kong autonomy movement. As a result, new protests would erupt in the aftermath of the elections. Considering the stakes and the 19th Communist Congress, the Chinese president will most likely tread carefully in regards to Hong Kong. Nevertheless, protests are likely to occur anyway, as Hong Kong will also mark the 20-year anniversary of the city's transition from the United Kingdom to China. Foreign policy-wise, Jinping's biggest obstruction will come from his American counterpart, where the leadership has expressed willingness to take a harder stance against China. In recent months, there has been a lot of talk regarding a trade war between the United States and China. However, the involved parties have no bilateral trade treaties. Therefore, in legal terms, only the World Trade Organization, or WTO for short, can dictate the regulations. Meaning, if Trump decides to take action, he may do so through the court of the WTO. On the other hand, China could retaliate by legally revising the standards of American commodities. As detrimental as this sounds, a legal battle regulated by the WTO would at least prevent a trade war. However, Trump could also decide to bypass legal regulations and take unilateral action by enforcing tariffs as high as 45% on Chinese imports. Such a decision would mostly hurt American consumers, as Chinese companies would just diversify their supply chains in other parts of Asia. But more importantly, as Washington targets Chinese trade, China would hit back by bypassing WTO regulations as well. Thus, a Chinese-American trade war would only erupt if both sides violated international regulations. Another battle space between Chinese, American and regional interests is the South China Sea. In recent years, Beijing's leverage in the region has grown substantially due to its artificial islands and modernization of its military. 
The South China Sea is the world's busiest maritime intersection. Many East Asian and Southeast Asian countries depend on the open sea lines of communication for their trade, logistics and security. Therefore, whoever dominates the sea will eventually subjugate East Asia. For Beijing, the South China Sea plays a crucial role in the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership or RCEP for short, which is a replacement for the now abandoned Trans-Pacific Partnership. The Chinese economic bloc is still in its infancy, but it would include major economies such as South Korea, Japan, Indonesia, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, India and even Australia. At the core of the RCEP lies the South China Sea, which is why the disputed sea is such a high priority for Beijing. However, following the International Court of Arbitration's ruling against China's maritime territorial claims in 2016, Beijing is likely to adopt a more restrained approach. For instance, instead of overt provocations, the country will make subtle bilateral gestures and offer economic relief in exchange for political accommodation. One country where China's new policy has succeeded is the Philippines. President Duterte's confrontational stance towards Washington has created a lot of uncertainty in the region. To that end, Manila has used the confusion to extract more commitments by playing major powers against one another. Yet, in 2017, Duterte's policy stands a chance to backfire if Trump refuses to play along. Elsewhere in the region, the military government of Thailand will try to maintain social and political stability amidst financial difficulties. As a result, civilian political parties will be prevented from introducing economic reforms. In neighboring Myanmar, ethnic cleansing against the Rohingya people in Rakhine state is radicalizing the desperate population. Recently, the Haraka al yagin a well-funded and well-trained insurgent groups with ties to Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, has emerged in the region. If Myanmar does not change its course against the Rohingya people in 2017, a Muslim insurgency will wreak havoc in the country. Further east in Vietnam, 2017 will be a restless year. The government will seek to implement economic reforms, such as reducing its dependency on China, restoring its fiscal stability and balancing its national budget. In the meantime, however, the financial changes will restrict political reform. One more distinct event will take shape in Malaysia where Prime Minister Razak and other top officials of the ruling party face corruption charges. With the general election scheduled for mid-2018, Razak has sought for ways to revalidate his legitimacy and credibility. His plan is to appease to a wider audience by reaching out to conservative religious voters. In doing so, the ruling party is expected to give in to the demands of the opposition, the Pan-Malaysia Islamic Party, which has for decades campaigned to legalize religious punishments. Thus, in March 2017, lawmakers in Malaysia will begin discussing Hadi's bill, which seeks to amend the Sharia Court Act by enforcing the morality police. The debate over the legislation will determine the social political situation in Malaysia in the years to come. In neighboring Indonesia, President Widodo has sought to use the mechanisms of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, also known as ASEAN, to engage in multilateral negotiations with China. At the President, Widodo is seeking to secure ASEAN maritime interests by working out a binding code of conduct with China. The agreement concerns fishing patrols, disaster relief, drug trafficking prevention, and security coordination. The proposal, however, does not formulate an enforcement mechanism. In any case, it is expected that the involved parties will reach an understanding in 2017. And if successful, Indonesia's efforts will enable a platform of dialogue for other regional nations with China. Subsequently, it will also propel Jakarta to the forefront in the South China Sea dispute as a major player in Southeast Asia. Another nation that will become more self-reliant in the face of a resurgent China is Japan. The country is overwhelmingly dependent on the import of raw materials from Southeast Asia and the Persian Gulf. Therefore, China's militarization in South and East China Seas is a direct threat to Japan. 
Currently, Tokyo depends on Washington to guarantee its access to the maritime trading routes. However, with Trump in office, Prime Minister Abe is questioning the commitments of the Americans. As such, Japan cannot sit idly by and allow for a Chinese hegemony to take shape. With this realization, Abe has worked to reinterpret the constitutional role of the military. Recently, he made serious progress when the National Security Council approved new rules of engagement which now allows for Japan to defend allied forces in times of peace. And although no further breakthrough is expected in 2017, Japan is gradually shifting away from seven decades of military pacifism. However, reforming the military is only part of the plan. The truth is, Japan is in a demographic and economic decline. Meanwhile, China's GDP is five times larger and its population is ten times that of Japan's. In other words, Tokyo cannot afford to get into an arms race with China. Instead, the Japanese must seek for regional allies. Beginning in 2016, Abe has sought to forge closer ties with regional countries. For instance, recently Japan has pledged $8.6 billion in financial aid to the Philippines, as well as a $7.7 .7 billion package to Myanmar. Over the course of 2017, similar packages could be offered to Indonesia and Vietnam. However, most of the Southeast Asian countries have extensive economic ties with China. The contradiction between economic and security interests will refrain most of the Southeast Asian nations from forging too close security relations with Japan, meaning Abe's foreign commitments will be met with mixed results. In spite of the rising geopolitical tensions, there is one issue that could promote cooperation in the region, namely North Korea's nuclear weapons program. Last year, the leadership in Pyongyang accelerated its nuclear weapons program, which has raised concerns in East Asia. In 2017, North Korea will continue to conduct additional tests, which mostly serve as a reminder of the strategic importance of the country. However, Pyongyang's nuclear program could also compel South Korea, Japan and China to cooperate more closely. Recently, Beijing suspended all imports of coal from North Korea, which is Pyongyang's largest export item and China's greatest point of leverage over the regime. Thus, given the fact that even China is upset with North Korea, temporary cooperation in East Asia can evolve. Essentially, the geopolitics in East Asia revolves around China. And so, as China's economy matures and growth slows down, neighboring countries must adjust to a new future. This was a Caspian Report by Mishirvan. I want to thank our contributors on Patreon for their wonderful support. And if you're looking for additional content and sources, check out our Intel briefings, which we publish weekly on Patreon. In any case, thank you for your time and sagol.